Good morning. Our text this morning is Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. Hear the word of the living and the true God. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw, we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him, and he assembled the, all the chief priests and scribes of the people, and he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly, and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. And after listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and they worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Thus far as the reading of God's holy and inspired word, let us pray together. God, we thank you for the technology that allows us to get out the message of your gospel. Father, we pray now that you would open up ears, eyes, hearts, and minds, uh, enlighten the eyes of our hearts that we might see your truth, uh, that we may receive your truth for what it is. We, we pray, God, that you would give us insight and help us to understand this and apply it to our lives. We pray that you would shape us through the preaching of your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we continue in our Advent series, and we pick up the story in Matthew's Gospel, uh, following where we left off last week, uh, with the announcement of the coming of Emmanuel and his birth to a virgin. God with us came as a baby. Christmas, as we know, is the time when we celebrate the coming of our King, our Lord and Savior, Jesus, the Messiah. Now, just very briefly, to anybody who is uh, maybe a little bit uncomfortable with the celebration of Christmas, I know there's a lot of uh, rumors and different ideas that kind of float around this time of year. I just want to mention that our church holds to the regulative principle of worship. And what this means is that we believe that we must worship God in the ways that he himself has ordained. And so for this reason, you will never see us replace the regular elements of our worship, prayer, reading scripture, uh, singing, uh, preaching and the sacraments. We will never replace these with something like a Christmas play uh, because we believe that would be a violation of what God has ordained for his church in public worship. However, when it comes to something like celebrating or not celebrating Christmas, we see this as an area of Christian liberty. Here's how our confession puts it. God alone is Lord of the conscience and he has left it free from human doctrines and commandments that are in any way contrary to his word or are not contained in it. And so that means there is great freedom for the Christian. God in his word does not command you to celebrate Christmas, but he also does not forbid you from celebrating the birth of the Christ. And so we believe that we are therefore free to celebrate it if we so choose, and we are free to abstain if we would choose. Um, there are, of course, scriptural principles for us to apply. Uh, questions, warnings against materialism, uh, drunkenness, gluttony, etc. But scripture does not prohibit the celebration of Christmas. Um, and I believe personally that the season of Christmas provides many wonderful opportunities for us. As the culture, at, at least up until this point has not managed to completely erase the Christ-centered nature of Christmas and the many traditions that have developed from it. <clears throat> now, the regulative principle does govern what we do in worship, but it does not mean that everything in our life needs to have positive biblical warrant. 
If this were the case, then, well, we would not be able to drive cars as we never see anything in scripture about driving cars. So we believe where scripture has not spoken directly, we simply uh, apply biblical principles. Now, there's nothing sinful about driving cars. There's nothing sinful about giving gifts, nothing sinful about family gatherings, uh, nothing inherently sinful about any of these things, certainly nothing sinful about giving thanks to God for giving us the great gift of his son. So my position is that if we are free to celebrate, which I believe we are, well then why in the world would we not want to celebrate what is likely the greatest miracle that has ever taken place, and that is God the Son entering into his own creation, taking on a human nature, and coming to be our Savior. So with that said, let's pick up this morning with the account of the coming of the wise men in Matthew chapter 2. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. Now Matthew specifies here that Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. Uh, that is likely to distinguish it uh, from the other Bethlehem, which was located in the region of Zebulun. Judea is the Greek form of the Hebrew name Judah. So this is Bethlehem in the land of Judah. Now after Jesus was born, we see here that wise men came from the east. Now exactly who these wise men were, uh, we don't know for sure. Uh, the word used is magi. Uh, used here uh, and also in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, it gets used in uh, Jeremiah 39 verse 13 uh, in the name Rab Meg which there means chief of the Magi. Uh, what we see is that many of the ancient pagan nations, such as Babylon, uh, per Medo-Persia, and Assyria, they frequently had wise men who were advisors to the kings. Now these wise men were considered to be knowledgeable in discerning mysteries. They were often associated with magic, mystical arts, fortune-telling, and astrology. Uh, it's very likely this is the type of role that Daniel and his friends uh, were brought into uh, among the exiles in Babylon. And this seems like it may have been the role of the Rab Meg here in Jeremiah 39. And so it's possible then that the Magi were like these. They are the, the type of wise men who would be knowledgeable in discerning mysteries. Uh, many have speculated that since they follow the star, they may have themselves been astrologers. And that's possible. Uh, another possibility is that they were actually high officials from an eastern kingdom such as Persia. They came as official representatives uh, acting as emissaries coming to give tribute to this new king uh, in Judah. And I think this theory has some merit as well. Uh, the lavish gifts that they give uh, would be fitting, uh, bringing the wealth of the nation. This certainly fits with the kinds of gifts that would be given as tribute from emissaries to a king that they were seeking to honor. In any event, the Magi come to King Herod in Jerusalem and they ask, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw its, his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. Now what exactly they saw in the sky is disputed. Um, some astro astronomers, modern astronomers, have suggested that the star they saw was a convergence of, of the planets Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, what happens every so often is that as the orbits of these planets uh, cause the planets from our perspective to align, uh, they appear to combine into one and appear as a single bright star in the sky. Now, interestingly, Jupiter and Saturn are again very close together and will appear to converge on December 21st. Uh, there has not been a convergence like this that was, that was this visible, will be this visible from Earth. Uh, there hasn't been that since the Middle Ages. Uh, so if you're curious to see what some people have theorized uh, may have been the Christmas star, well, then I'd encourage you to look to the southwest shortly after sundown on December 21st, and you might be able to see it. Uh, there's a few other theories. Some speculate that it may have been a comet, which would also appear like a star shining in the sky for a period. Others have suggested it may have been a supernova, 
where a star burns out but temporarily will burn uh, extremely bright and hot for a period before it disappears altogether. And some others have suggested that the event was simply supernatural. God caused a unique light to shine in the sky uh, for a period of time and then caused it to disappear afterwards without a trace. Uh, obviously, that's not a theory that can be proven or disproven. Um, but in, a, in any event, what we do know is that the Magi had correctly deduced from the appearance of the star that it was there to herald the birth of a king. But now that raises another question. Why would they have connected the appearance of the star to the land of Judah? Why would they come to Jerusalem looking specifically for the king of the Jews? Well, at this point in history, there was still a large number of Jewish exiles that were living in those eastern kingdoms. If you remember, over the last couple of weeks, we talked about how the Assyrians came and invaded Israel. They took exiles uh, into their lands. Later, Babylon came and conquered Judah. Um, well, some of the exiles had been allowed to return to the land of Israel, but there were still a good number that were dispersed uh, throughout those eastern kingdoms. And so according to the ancient historians, Tacitus and Suetonius, the Jews in those eastern kingdoms had been very successful in spreading the idea that their Messiah was soon to come. As one commentator has written, it was expected throughout the whole East that about that time a king was to arise in Judea who should rule all the world. And so we must remember these Jews that were in exile were some of the same ones, or at least the descendants of the same ones, who had received the prophecies which we've looked at over the last couple of weeks. Isaiah 9 verse 2, remember this prophecy, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. Verse 6, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there shall be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. And so the people understood that a king was coming. Genesis 49 verse 10 says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him. And to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Now the, the Hebrew word used in this passage is Shiloh, which means uh, he to whom it is due. So there's a prophecy here. Strong's and the NAS concordance uh, say that this is a messianic title. So there's the prophecy here that the scepter, the ruling scepter, will not depart from the tribe of Judah until Shiloh comes, until he comes to whom tribute is due, he to whom it belongs, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. So we can start to get an idea. If they knew of these prophecies, well, we can understand why there might have been high expectation for the coming of a king who would rule the world. A similar passage is seen in Numbers chapter 24, verse 17. Which says, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall arise out of Israel. It shall crush the forehead of Moab and break down all the sons of Sheth. So the people knew that a king was coming. Now, fascinatingly, the scriptures had even predicted the timing of the coming of this king. You can turn with me to Daniel chapter 2. We'll read from verse 36. This is uh, one, of, one of the most mind-blowing passages in the Bible when you uh, actually understand what it's saying here. Um, so as you're turning there to Daniel chapter 2 verse 36, I'll just give you the context. Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar has had a dream, and in his dream he saw a statue of a man. And the statue had a head that was made of gold, 
uh, a ch chest and arms of silver, middle and thighs of bronze, and then it had legs of iron, and at the bottom there was iron mixed with clay. And so Nebuchadnezzar then saw a stone that was not cut by any human hand, and that stone struck the statue and shattered it, and then the stone grew and became a mountain that filled the whole earth. So King Nebuchadnezzar was disturbed. He called all his wise men, and none of them, well, <laughs> he was kind of unreasonable. He said that they had to both tell him what his dream was and give the interpretation. And of course, apart from the intervention of the one true God, none of his wise men were able to do that until Daniel comes and God gives to Daniel the interpretation. Daniel 2 verse 36. This was the dream. Now we will tell the king its interpretation. You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, and the might, and the glory, and into whose hand he has given wherever they dwell, the children of man, the beasts of the field, and the birds of the heavens, making you rule over them all, you are the head of gold. Another kingdom, inferior to you, shall arise after you, and yet a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And there shall be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things. And like iron that crushes, it shall break and crush all of these. And as you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom. But some of the firmness of iron shall still be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with soft clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. As he saw the iron mixed with soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together, just as iron does not mix with clay. Now, notice this. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. A great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation sure. So Daniel gives to King Nebuchadnezzar the interpretation of his dream. He says that each section of the statue represented a different kingdom. Daniel says to King Nebuchadnezzar that he is the head of gold. The kingdom of Babylon is this head of gold. They had risen to prominence, and Daniel says they were a great and mighty kingdom. And then he says, after Babylon, an inferior kingdom will arise and conquer. And then there will be another one, and then another one. Then verse 44, And in the days of those kings, that so in the days of the fourth kingdom, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. In the days of the fourth kingdom, God will set up an everlasting kingdom. Now, if we know history... We can figure out pretty easily which kingdoms are being spoken of. So does anybody know who conquered Babylon? Well, it was the Medes and the Persians. And that one's actually pretty easy to answer, as it actually gets recorded in the book of Daniel as well. Uh, king Belshazzar was King Nebuchadnezzar's son, and he was conquered by a king that we know, uh, King Darius. Daniel 5 verse 30, that very night... Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. So that was now the second kingdom, the kingdom of silver. After this would come the kingdom of bronze, followed by the kingdom of iron. So does anybody know who conquered the Medes and the Persians? Well, it was the Greeks under Alexander the Great. Now, another interesting fact about him was that Alexander brought the Greek language to all of his conquered lands, which is why in the New Testament period, Greek was the common language everywhere. 
And that's actually part of what allowed Christianity to spread so quickly across the known world. So the Greeks were the third kingdom. They were the kingdom of bronze. And then there was one more, the kingdom of iron, the one that would be par partly brittle, partly strong, but had the firmness of iron in it. Does anybody know who ended up conquering the Greeks? Well, it was the Romans. Rome is therefore the fourth kingdom. And so notice the prophecy here in verse 44. In the days of those kings, the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. So in the days of those kings, while Rome is ruling, God will establish another kingdom, one that shall never be destroyed. And so as we arrive back into Matthew chapter 2, guess which kingdom is ruling during this time? Rome. The people knew that there was a king coming. The timing was right. There was a Messiah. Anybody who was familiar and had understood Daniel's prophecy would likely have been very expectant about the coming of the Messiah in the days of the fourth kingdom. Those exiled Jews, according to the ancient historians, they had stirred up messianic expectations in those lands. And so the people understood that a king was coming who would be born of Judah. And so if the, if the Magi were familiar with the prophecy from Numbers 24, 17, a star shall come out of Jacob and a scepter shall arise out of Israel, well then we can very clearly understand how they might have arrived at the conclusion that they did. Now we don't know this for sure, we, we don't know what their level of knowledge was, but given the prophecies, given uh, the prevalence of the expectations of the Messiah, uh, it, it really does explain uh, or give a possible explanation for why the Magi may have arrived at the conclusions they did. And so the appearance of a new star seeming to hang over the land of Judah to the west in a time anticipating the arrival of a great king could very easily explain why the Magi arrived at their conclusion. Continuing on. So the Magi here arrive in Jerusalem and they come to King Herod and they ask, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and we have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Now we'll come back to discuss a little bit more of why Herod was troubled by this later. But verse 4, his reaction, And assembling all the chief priests of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of, Jude of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Now this is a really interesting passage. The first thing we note is that it does demonstrate more about the messianic expectations at this time. The Jews were clearly familiar, uh, at least with certain elements of messianic prophecy. Now, in spite of this, what becomes clear throughout the life of Jesus is that the expectations they had developed were incomplete at best. There's another interesting fact here. Notice that Herod is asked by the Magi about the king of the Jews, and then he summons the priests and the scribes and asks them where the Christ is to be born. Now, I think when we think of Jesus as the Christ, I think the common thing for us to do is to associate that title primarily with his redemptive work. We think of what he did to save us, right? His providing our righteousness and paying the penalty for our sins, defeating death. And this is certainly an element of what the Christ was to do. But it's noteworthy here that Herod uh, primarily associates the title of Christ with his office of king. Now, as I said in a recent sermon, when we identify Jesus as the Christ or as the Messiah, we are making the assertion that he is the promised descendant of David. 
we are saying that he is the one to whom tribute belongs, that he is the shoot from the stump of Jesse, uh, the son of man who would receive an everlasting dominion. His designation as Messiah is an assertion that he is the true ruler, the prophesied king. Now what the Jews seem to have missed about this was that this Messiah, this descendant of David, was also the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. 53. If you're familiar with that passage, he was uh, pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that has brought us peace. He is indeed the Christ, but his name was to be called Jesus, for he would save his people from their sins. The name Jesus means the Lord saves. And he did indeed come to save his people from their sins. So it's actually really interesting that when we put the name of Jesus together with his title of Christ or Messiah, we are asserting that he is both Lord and Savior. The promised king, the Christ, the Messiah, the descendant of David, Jesus, who came to save his people from their sins. The Lord saves um, by his appointed king. So the Jews seem to have missed part of his role. Uh, however, regarding the birthplace of the Christ, the Jews were spot on. Uh, they quote from Micah 5, verse 2. <clears throat> And they say, But you, O Bethlehem, Epaphra, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be a ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. Now this is actually a very straightforward prophecy. If you remember last week, we looked at how in some cases, the New Testament reveals to us Old Testament fulfillments uh, that even the prophets themselves uh, may not have understood. Now this one's different. It is actually quite clear. As Craig Bloomberg writes, this text can be viewed via a very straightforward scheme of prediction and fulfillment with no multiple or deeper levels of meaning or use of typology. Micah prophesied that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem and now it has happened. Close quote. And so Herod calls together the Jews, the scribes, and the chief priests. Uh, he, he calls in the Bible scholars uh, to ask where the Messiah, where the Christ, was to be born. And so they know the answer to that question. And, when, and so Herod calls the wise men back, verse 7. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. Now, we likely know this story. Herod was lying, and he had no intention at all of coming to worship Jesus. What's fascinating here is that Herod seems to believe that this child being born truly was the prophesied Messiah. And even knowing that, even believing that, Herod still wanted to murder him. Now, Martin Beck and Hansen take the view that the Magi were Parthian emissaries, that is Persian emissaries, bearing expensive gifts to honor the new king, and they suggest an explanation for Herod's response here. It's a quote from them. Several decades before Jesus was born, Jewish loyalists had enlisted the aid of Parthians, that is Persians, to drive Herod and his family from power in Jerusalem. Herod then fled to Rome, where the Roman Senate honored him with the title King of the Jews. But when Herod returned to Israel in 37 BC, he had to fight long and hard for the right to bear that title. Since that time, he had ruthlessly defended it against all those whom he saw as a threat even killing his own sons and wives when he felt they were conspiring to remove him from the throne. The Magi entered Jerusalem with Herod's royal paranoia still intact. Given the expensive gifts these Parthian wise men were bearing, 
they would have entered the city of Jerusalem with an armed escort. We can only imagine the panic that must have occurred in the court of Herod when, the, when they heard that men from the east were in Jerusalem looking for the legitimate king of the Jews. Close quote. So Herod saw this child as a threat. Herod had received the title of being king of the Jews, and he had fought long and hard for that title. And so now, as these foreign dignitaries come to town, quite possibly from the same nation that helped drive Herod out of Jerusalem 30 years earlier, and these men come with royal gifts in order to honor the birth of one they call the true king of the Jews. Now it makes sense that a king who was so paranoid and obsessed with power that he would be willing to kill his own sons and wives, well, a king like that is not going to tolerate someone else in his region receiving the title king of the Jews. And the fact is, Jesus is the true king of the Jews. King Herod's father was an Edomite. I, 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 do mean, I can't even say the word. We'll just say he was an Edomite. Uh, and the Edomites were the descendants of Esau. Esau, as we may know, was the twin brother of Jacob, who was later renamed Israel. And so here's the situation for King Herod. God had spoken about who the rightful ruler would be for his people. Remember the word Shiloh, he to whom it belongs, he to whom tribute is owed. It was not the Edomites who had received this promise. The one true ruler was to be from the line of Judah, one of the sons of Israel. A great king and descendant of Judah, whom we know, had received a promise from God that God would establish his kingdom and his line. 2 Samuel 7, 16, God says to King David of the line of Judah, Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Now, does anybody remember why Mary and Joseph were in Bethlehem in the first place? Now, Bethlehem wasn't their home. It's not where they lived. Uh, Luke chapter 2 records for us that Caesar Augustus had ordered a census. And so rather than going from door to door, everybody was required to return to, their, to the town of their lineage. And so Luke 2, 20, uh, 2 verse 4 says this, And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. And so the very reason that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, I mean, other than God fulfilling prophecy, uh, but the, the earthly reason, the secondary cause we see here, is because he was a descendant of David, descended from the tribe of Judah, of the line of David, and he is the true king. He is the one whose right it is. He is Shiloh, the one to whom tribute belongs. King Herod may have zealously defended his title as king of the Jews, but the fact remained he was not their true king. God had promised that office to another. Let's continue on in verse 9. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Now, we're not entirely sure what happened here. The star may have been out of sight for a time and then became visible to them again as they went off towards Bethlehem to search for the child. Uh, it's unlikely that the wise men arrived on the very night of Jesus' birth. Uh, one of the reasons for this, you'll notice that the story here makes no mention of the stable or of the manger. And verse 11 even refers to the fact that Jesus was in a house. So we can see perhaps some time had passed. And as the visitors to the town uh, who had been there for the census began to disperse and go back to their own towns, 
Well, some space seems to have opened up in Bethlehem, and it appears Mary and Joseph had found some proper lodging. Now, it makes sense that they would not have wanted to leave Bethlehem right away. Uh, anybody who has uh, <laughs> held a newborn would probably not be eager to do much extended cross-country traveling uh, with a brand new baby. Um, and so they continued in Bethlehem for a time. And so this would then mean that the wise men came some time after the visit of the shepherds, who, had been, who, having been visited by angels in the middle of the night and directed to visit the baby Jesus, would undoubtedly have spread word of what they have seen. And so it's very likely that at this point in time, in the small town of Bethlehem, uh, there was still just a buzz of, with the news of what the shepherds had uh, seen and heard. And so if that were the case, it would actually make the search quite easy for the wise men as they come and arrive in Bethlehem. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and they worshipped him. Now it's possible that the wise men were bowing down to Jesus, uh, simply as would have been customary to show respect by bowing before a king. But whether they knew it or not, this was the best possible response that they could have given upon seeing Jesus. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts of gold, of frankincense, and of myrrh. Now, it's interesting, the word offer here is not always, but is often used to refer to bringing an offering to God. Uh, the JFB commentary writes this, This expression, used frequently in the Old Testament of the oblations presented to God, is in the New Testament employed seven times and always in a religious sense of offerings to God. Beyond doubt, therefore, we are to understand the presentation of these gifts by the Magi as a religious offering. And so here it was. The timing was right. It was now within the days of the fourth kingdom from Daniel chapter 2, and God himself had sent the king who would establish a kingdom that would never be destroyed. This was the child from the line of Judah, Shiloh, the one to whom tribute belongs, to whom would be the obedience of the peoples. This was the shoot from the stump of Jesse, the king from the line of David, come to establish his throne to, uh, forever. A star had come out of Jacob. A scepter was rising in Israel. The people who walked in darkness had seen a great light. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end Bow down before the Christ child, God in human flesh, fully God, fully man, deserving of all our allegiance, our service, and our worship. And so the Magi present their royal gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And as they do, it's, it seems very much like they are rendering tribute to the Messiah. Now Matthew doesn't draw this element out, but even in this, there are echoes of Old Testament prophecies here. Psalm 72, verse 8 to 11 says this, May he have dominion from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. May desert tribes bow down before him and his enemies lick the dust. May the kings of Tarshish and of the coastlands render him tribute. May the kings of Sheba and Seba bring gifts. May all kings fall down before him. All nations serve him. One commentator notes that Tarshish here may simply be representative of any distant nation with great wealth. Or consider the even more explicit statement in Isaiah 60 verse 6. A multitude of camels shall cover you, the young camels of Midian and Ephah. All those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense, and shall bring good news, the praises of the Lord. And so just as we saw in, uh, if you've read through the story of Solomon, that he received tribute from the Queen of Sheba, from foreign nations, so also there are prophecies of tribute coming 
under the reign of the Messiah. And so the offerings here of gold, frankincense, and myrrh are the offerings of tribute from foreign nations to the new king, the one to whom tribute is due. And so the Magi here bowing down before the Christ foreshadows the future. For this is the king before whom every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Philippians 2.11. Continuing on in Matthew. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. So God here warns the Magi that Herod's stated intention was not true. He had no intentions of worshiping the Christ. He has no intention of acknowledging Jesus as the true king of the Jews. We actually see from verse 16 that Herod's intention was to murder the child. Herod saw Jesus as a threat. People came to King Herod declaring that there was another king and Herod could not tolerate it. Well, the fact was Herod may have been the first, but he was certainly not the last king to see Jesus as a threat. The early Christians were persecuted, not because they worshipped Jesus. Uh, Rome was a pagan nation. Rome had tons of gods. Uh, If you wanted to, you could worship Zeus or Jupiter, if you preferred. You could worship Artemis or Jesus. Rome didn't care. Who you worshipped in your heart or in your head or in your home or even the temple uh, was not really a big deal to them. So long as you were able uh, and willing to make a particular declaration. The declaration that Caesar is Lord. Uh, Kaiser Kurios. That Caesar is supreme and your ultimate allegiance is to him. Now doing so was actually a very, very brilliant method of keeping their entire empire united. As they would conquer foreign peoples, uh, they would allow those peoples to add their gods uh, to the pantheon of gods. Uh, Those were all legitimate gods in people's minds. You could worship who you wanted as long as you were willing to say, uh, Caesar is Lord. And so the claim of the Christian church was then and is now a true affront to the claims of anyone who wants to be the ultimate. The Christians refused to say that Caesar is Lord because at the very heart of the Christian faith is this uh, fundamental assertion. Jesus is Lord. Christ is is supreme. He is the ruler of the kings of the earth, and he is the sovereign before whom all must bow. And so the Christians in Acts 17 faced persecution for this exact reason. Now notice, if you if you turn there with me, look at what the accusation was that was brought against Paul and Silas uh, from Acts 17, I believe it was verse 7 says, these men who have turned the whole world upside down have come here also. And Jason have received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar. Ready? Saying that there is another king, Jesus. And so this became the option for many Christians. Either you burn the pinch of incense to Caesar, acknowledge him to be supreme, or you face death. Thousands of Christians went to their deaths because of their declaration that Jesus and not Caesar is Lord. Now, Christians will be uh, the best citizens under a righteous civil magistrate. We very happily acknowledge and submit to governing authorities because we know and believe that all civil authorities have been instituted by God. And so then our submission, our willingness to follow and be governed by civil authorities uh, is actually an extension of our submission to God. However, Christians will always be viewed as dangerous and seditious by any government that begins to develop a Messiah complex. 
When government decides that they are supreme, when they begin to demand ultimate allegiance from their people, faithful Christians will always be viewed as a threat to the civil order because faithful Christians will always declare that there is another king, Jesus. <clears throat> and so this is presently what we actually see happening in the world uh, in places like communist China. Uh, the Marxist communist government demands ultimate allegiance from their people. In communist China, the government has instructed citizens to replace crosses and religious symbols with pictures of the leader of the communist party. Christians and churches who are unwilling to bow to the agenda of the Communist Party are considered dangerous to society. Uh, it's believed that they undermine social harmony by declaring that there is a higher king, that there is a true savior, and that his authority is in fact higher than the Communist Party. In Communist China, as in first century Rome, I don't think they really care what you believe, as long as you keep it to yourself. You can believe whatever you want. Jesus can be Lord in your heart and perhaps between your ears. So long as you're willing to acknowledge the supremacy and lordship of Caesar, so long as you're willing to acknowledge the supremacy and ultimacy of the Communist Party. And we ask the question, is it really so different here? What do we often get told? Vern Poitras writes this, in the modern West, many cultural leaders wish to keep religion private. They say, keep it to yourself or keep it in your family. Cultural leaders want most of life to be secular, a realm where your religion makes no difference. They say, in effect, keep your Jesus out of business, work, education, science, technology, government, politics, entertainment, media, and the arts. But if Jesus is, in fact, Lord of all, he is Lord in all those areas of life. He is already there in his divine authority and power and presence, and so you cannot keep him out. And trying to keep him out is already a violation of his claims to lordship. Close quote. Herod, the Roman emperors, the communists, and any other government or system that claims supremacy for itself is absolutely right to see Jesus as a threat. If they claim ultimacy for themselves, Jesus is their rival. Our ultimate allegiance is to Jesus. God has instituted civil government, but he has not given civil government absolute authority. Christians, as ambassadors of the kingdom of God, answer, first of all, to Christ. Now, insofar as we are not restricted from obeying God, we will be very conscientious citizens. But we acknowledge that it is Christ who is supreme. And therefore, no government has the authority to forbid what God has commanded or to command what God forbids. When we are forced to choose, the faithful Christian will say with the apostles, we must obey God rather than men. And this perspective is always going to be a threat to the governments who desire supremacy or who develop a Messiah complex. Caesar is not Lord and the state is not the savior. According to German historian Ethelbert Stauffer, the religious principle of the Roman Empire from the days of Augustus on was salvation by Caesar. Quote, salvation is to be found in none other save Augustus, and there is no other name given to men in which they can be saved. Close quote. Now, if that sounds familiar, it should, because the Apostle Peter hijacks this phrase and he declares with boldness in Acts 4, 11, and 12, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus is the Savior. 
Jesus is the king. Jesus is the one who brings true and lasting salvation. Jesus delivers his people from bondage to sin and death. Jesus is a great king, and he is a compassionate king. His kingdom spreads not through force of arms or at the point of a sword. We do not advance the kingdom of God through coercion or by force, but we conquer as Christ conquered. He suffered, he died, and he laid his own life down willingly and rose again. And this is the pattern we follow. We die to ourselves daily. We offer our lives for others, both in service to one another and in proclamation of the gospel. We proclaim the message of reconciliation, that through the perfect life of Christ, he has provided our righteousness. Through his substitutionary death, he paid the penalty for sins, giving his life on the cross. And he has risen from death, and he has guaranteed the future resurrection unto life of all of his people. And so absolutely anyone who turns to Christ in repentance and faith will be saved. Romans 10 verse 9 says this, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Christ conquers not through external coercion at the point of the sword, but through the preaching of the gospel, his word, which is sharper than any two-edged sword, as it cuts down to the heart of man. The Spirit of God makes the preaching of the gospel effectual in the hearts of his people, and people are transformed from rebels into citizens. Enemies become sons of God. Those who were dead in transgression and sins are made alive by the power of the Spirit of God, raised up to walk in newness of life. And in this way, Christ conquers. His kingdom grows through the power of the Spirit, working through the preaching of the gospel, as his people are faithful to make disciples, to be fruitful and to multiply, discipling and educating their children to know and love Christ. Jesus is Lord. He is the true King. He is the Sovereign, and our ultimate allegiance is always to Him. And He is therefore Lord over every area of our lives, and we must labor to bring everything into submission to His will. As Abraham Kuyper famously said, There is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is Sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. And so let us labor to bring all things under the feet of Christ. Let us kill our sin, bring our lives in their entirety into conformity with his will. Let us proclaim that our king has come and that he has made reconciliation available to rebel sinners. Jesus Christ is Lord and one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And I'll leave you with the words of Psalm 2. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Merry Christmas.